Hey, good afternoon, everybody. This is Eric with Flatbridge Ed. I wanted to take uh, 10 or 12 minutes and do a quick podcast on uh, trauma arrest and the management of trauma arrest. I know that there's different approaches out there, uh, whether you're a ground EMS provider and, and you're a new paramedic out there. You may be a little bit more aggressive in your treatment versus a, a seasoned medic that's been in the field for a long time. And I know the trauma uh, aspect as it relates to ER medicine is a little bit different. So I'd kind of like to just hit on a few topics uh, related to trauma arrest throw in my two cents. Um, some of these uh, ideas I have or feelings may, uh, are again, just my biased opinion. Uh, they may not be shared with other people. So uh, I will talk a little bit about research, kind of the, the philosophy uh, that's being seen in these level one trauma centers, um, and we'll kind of put it all together. So we'll start out with a quick scenario. Um, I think it's um, important to, in this setting to give you a scenario that relates to this topic. So our scenario starts off with a 40-year-old female patient. She was riding on a motorcycle with her husband. Uh, they were going down a rural road. Uh, neither of them were wearing helmets, uh, and for some reason they, they ended up crashing the motorcycle. We're going to relate this to helicopter, uh, helicopter scene flight. You get launched on this scene flight, and you get up in the air, uh, land, and when you approach the scene, you have to walk maybe a quarter mile to the waiting ambulance. Uh, you see that the patient's husband is deceased in the middle of the roadway. You can see that he has multiple um, extremity fractures, massive head trauma. Uh, You enter the back of the ambulance, you get a report from the ground EMS uh, provider, the paramedic on scene, and uh, as you're performing your primary assessment, uh, your patient becomes pulseless and um, stops breathing and goes into a full cardiac arrest. So what do we do in that situation? If you're a ground EMS provider and you didn't have a helicopter available, in that situation, uh, you may treat it a little a little bit differently. In some areas of the country, um, you would have the leeway or the, the medical direction backing to call that code immediately. Remember, when you're talking about a trauma arrest and you're in a rural facility or, or a rural setting like that and your patient arrests that quickly after an event, um, there's nothing we're going to be able to do for the most part that's going to bring them back. You know, And this is where I kind of get into the ethics side of it. If they have massive head trauma and they arrest that quickly, you know, you may get their body back. You may be able to sustain a heart rate, but their brain is gone. And what are we doing? I mean, you know, that there, there's, no, um, there's no reason to attempt to resuscitate somebody like that. And I know, you know, some of you may think, well, you know, you're, you're playing God or, or whatever. I just believe that um, that's the best, the best choice. I know for my family, for me, for my children, I would not want anything done in that situation. Um, if, if they were brain dead or, um, we're going to be a vegetable and on life support the rest of their life. Um, and again, that is just my opinion. When we're talking about traumatic arrest in this situation, you've got a helicopter on scene, you've got a critical care flight crew on scene. What can we do? Um, some protocols state that if, if somebody arrests, you never put a patient that is needing CPR in the back of a helicopter. Um, Depending on the the airframe that you're flying on, if you're flying in a 206, I can tell you from experience, doing CPR in the back of a a 206 or a 407 aircraft is extremely difficult. It's not very efficient. It's not not a good thing. Um, You really only have one provider that can perform that. It's very difficult to switch providers um, the way the airframe is set up. If you're flying in a BK-117, EC-145, aircrafts that are large, uh, EC-130s, um, you know, those airframes, it, it may be a little easier to do CPR and it might be more feasible. So what's going to bring this patient back, if anything? You know, the percentages to resuscitate a, a traumatic arrest like this um, are very, very low, I think below 1%, you know, when we when we see this in the field. You know, it's one thing if this patient arrests in the back of the ambulance as you're pulling up to the ER doors and you have definitive uh, care uh, you're at your disposal, you have a surgeon uh, right there, you have an operating room where, where they can actually um, start the definitive uh, care that's going to save the patient. But when we're out in the field like this, what are we going to do that's going to change um, their outcome, if anything? Well, there's a few things. So first I want to say is um, if you've listened to my podcast on the Platinum 10, um, you know we need to get off the ground. We need to attempt to get them to the, the, the closest definitive facility that can handle their injuries. That doesn't mean you take them to a small facility. 
Um, you know, that's probably not the best option. I have done that. I, I'll admit that I have done that. Um, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. They need to be going to a level one trauma center where there's a surgeon available. Um, what are the ACLS guidelines as it relates to this? You know, we have ACLS guidelines where we're going to give in a, in a, an arrest situation like this, what rhythm are they in? Are they in a PEA rhythm? Um, are we going to go down through an ACLS guideline PEA um, algorithm? Well, I can tell you right now, that's probably not going to do anything. If somebody has arrested that quickly after an injury like that, they've probably bled out, right? What are we doing giving epinephrine and chest compressions and doing all those things when they have no circulating blood volume to even oxygenate or, or circulate through their system? You're, you're really defeating the purpose. So let's talk about the different things that we can do as it relates to the injuries. Well, we know that most trauma happened. Um, you're going to have arrests um, probably from blunt or penetrating trauma, chest or abdomen. Not a lot of people die from sudden severe head trauma, you know, unless there's maybe a, a, a spinal cord transection or it's just a massive, massive uh, brainstem um, herniation that happens almost immediately. But that's usually not going to happen that quickly. So it's usually going to be secondary things. It's going to be chest trauma. Do they have an aortic arch tear? Do they have a liver lack? Have they ruptured their spleen? Things like that. That's what's going to kill them. So they've bled out. Do they have a massive tension pneumothorax? Do they have a pericardial um, tamponade from, from massive chest trauma? So those are the things that we can maybe do to uh, correct the, the, the arrest, right? When we, when we have a PEA, we need to be looking at the 5 H's and the 5 T's. What can we correct? All right, so let's always start with airway. If you've listened to my podcast on uh, cardiac arrest management, right? And I really start to, I, I talk about it and I challenge people to think outside the box where chest compressions are the number one thing that are gonna, that's going to make a difference in those patients. Stopping chest compressions to innovate a patient in that setting and, and, and reducing that pressure that you're building up in the, in the body by circulating that blood around is, is going to defeat the purpose. So in those settings, we need to be putting in a king airway or we just need to manage our airway with a BVM. Um, and that's the proper way to do it. And I know for some that, that may be hard to swallow because we like innovating, we like to do advanced airway maneuvers, but that's really not what's best for our patient. The same goes for this situation. And I'm, I'm going to throw out, uh, give props. Um, I've read quite a few charts in my primary role as an educator. Um, um, there's a base in uh, Indiana, uh, Louisville area, Corden, um, and I, I've seen a lot of their management of these traumatic arrests, and I, I've been very impressed with how they manage it. They, they, they don't worry about intubating. They don't worry about those things. They immediately put in a king airway, right? And so in this situation, for this scenario, this 40-year-old female, the first thing you should do is put in a king airway to manage the airway. You can put it in quickly. You can have it in within one minute, and you have a definitive airway that you can use to manage that airway. Second thing, what are we going to do? Well, people die from massive blunt and penetrating trauma. And for this situation, this female, she was on the back of a motorcycle going 40, 45 miles an hour, and she hit that pavement really hard. And she has massive head trauma, but she also probably has massive chest and abdominal trauma, right? So has the abdominal trauma with the liver, the, the spleen, has she ruptured her diaphragm? Does she have all those organs pushed up against her heart? Does she have a pericardial tamponade? Does she have tension pneumothorax, right? So at this point, really assessing these different things is kind of pointless. We just need to be going at it, and we need to be treating each one of these things. So the second thing we need to be doing before anything, this is before CPR, this is before, before IV access, for, before anything, we need to be doing bilateral chest decompressions immediately. So we've got a definitive airway in, we're putting in bilateral chest, chest decompressions, compressions. If you have the availability and you have a protocol to do chest tubes, we need to be doing chest tubes. That's what's going what's gonna to correct the problem. The third thing we need to be doing is a pericardial synthesis. Um, remember, the, you know, if you're ground medics, you're probably you're saying, holy cow. You know, and I, I said the same thing when I first learned the procedure. Um, I've performed one or two on traumatic arrest before. They're actually not very hard to do. Um, it's a little bit nerve-wracking sticking a needle that large in somebody's chest, but um, I can tell you that um, it, it wasn't that difficult. Now, for both of my experiences, I did not have any return of um, 
spontaneous circulation that was a benefit or a result of my pericardial synthesis that I did. But that is the science. That is what what needs to happen to kind of rule out that they don't have a pericardial tampon on. All right. So let's go through the kind of the, the process of that. Well, we're going to put a, a 60 cc syringe on. You can fill it with maybe 10 or 15 mils of normal saline. Um, you're going to put a needle on, and the needle's usually, you know, it's, it, I would say, um, 8 to 10 inches long. It's it's pretty small, 22 gauge. You're going to go in, you're going to find your xiphoid process, um, and you're going to go to the, the um, right of the xiphoid process, and you're going to aim down towards the scapula at a 45 degree angle towards that um, left shoulder and as you go in you're going to go in very slowly and you're going to be drawing back on that syringe and you're going to have a the cardiac monitor on the patient and you may see a change if you enter that vent that right ventricle you may see a change in your rhythm um, you may not and you're going to be drawing back you may or may not get any blood return so remember, it doesn't take a lot of blood around that pericardial sac to cause a tampon on. Um, you know, there's, I believe, and, and I may be wrong um, a little bit on my my numbers, but I think there's around 15 mils of, of fluid that, that surrounds the, the that pericardial sac, and it's for lubrication purposes and things like that. So it doesn't take a lot of fluid, 10, 15, 20 mils of fluid um, is all it's going to take to cause um, compression against that heart and and cause a tamponade. All right, so we've we've done a definitive airway um, with a king airway. We haven't messed around any with any any ET tubes or laryngoscopes or anything like that. We've done bilateral chest compressions. We've done um, now a pericardial synthesis. So what else can we do? Well, there's not a lot we can do at this point. Um, you know, it wouldn't be wrong at this point to call online medical control, medical direction, and call the code at this point. Um, if you have done all the, of these um, and, uh, you know, they still are in a, in a pulseless rhythm like this, there's nothing you're going to do. We don't carry blood. They need a surgeon. They've probably ruptured one of the three things I stated, either the aortic arch tear, a spleen, or a liver, and they've just ex exsanguinated all their blood out. So CPR in that situation, although we should be doing it, most protocols are going to tell you to do it, you're really not doing anything. You're not circulating any oxygen-rich blood, even though you, you may be ventilating them with a BVM or a King Airway. Um, so I guess what I'm trying to say is we need to be thinking about long-term clinical course. What are you doing for this patient? Um, by transporting them any further, are you going to help them? Um, you know, you're putting yourself at risk. You're putting your partner at risk. You're, you know, if you're going emergency traffic in an ambulance, things like that. So this is where we need to really critically think. We need to think about what we can do to benefit the patient, patient outcome. And if you've done all these things, if you've you know, got a definitive airway, you've done the um, bilateral chest decompressions, and you've done the pericardial synthesis, um, you, know, you could even go a step further and you could you know, decompress the stomach if you needed to put an OG tube down or something like that. But I can tell you that's probably not going to do anything. In the hospital setting, You know, they don't even really do uh, DPLs anymore. Um, they'll, they'll do fast exams and they'll they'll check for bleeding that way. Um, but really, that's all we can do. You know, giving epinephrine, uh, giving those things after somebody's arrested like that again is is not going to change the fact that they have no circulating blood volume. So I just wanted to take again uh, 10, 12, 15 minutes and just kind of talk about that, and get you guys thinking about that. I know that there's a um, especially in the helicopter realm um, you know most of our flights are very critical patients you know we get called to these traumatic arrests we have this happen all the time you know we have have a uh, very sick patient so um, you know the other aspect of that is you know you're flying along and these patients arrest in the back of the helicopter um, and you have to initiate these these uh, procedures do you divert to a closer facility or do you continue to a level one trauma center um, I guess it's all going to depend on the protocol, but I would encourage you to probably continue to a level one trauma center. I've done the diversion aspect, and I've diverted to these small facilities. And let me tell you, they cannot handle these patients. They're overwhelmed. They look at you like, why are you here? Are you crazy? We're not going to do anything for them. And really, there's nothing they're going to do in those small facilities that we can't do in the back of the helicopter. So continue to the level one trauma center. Um, that's all I have for this. Continue with the comments. Continue with uh, forwarding uh, your feedback. Um, we really enjoy hearing them and uh, hearing ideas for new
content. And so I would just uh, encourage you to get involved in the forums. We have many, many people. I think we're up to 30, 35 people registered for their forums account. I think people are a little nervous about getting involved. Um, I can tell you that um, we want to learn from you. We want to hear your, your ideas, and we want to hear your critical thinking skills and things like that. And, and these are going to be very laid-back forums, and, and we really would love your involvement. So on the behalf of myself and, and our team and our staff, we just want to thank you for listening, and we'll talk to you soon.